And it's just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Dennis Lambert. Hey, Howard. Good to see you. Thank you so much for coming by. Dennis serves as a deacon at Corpus Christi Parish, which, if you didn't know, is located right here in Albuquerque. While he has retired from a nearly 30-year career in the pharmaceutical industry, his days remain quite full in his service as a deacon in the Catholic Church in writing novels and along with his wife playing in a well-established local band called the Little Debbie Band. And um, this was your first book. It is. And you just came out with a second book. Didn't come out. I just finished my oh, sec- you just second finished. book. So, yeah. So. Well, um, gosh, I don't know where to start. So, tell, talk through the journey. I wonder how many people are working in a cubicle <laughs> for 30 years thinking, my gosh, this journey could go to a deacon of a Catholic church. Talk about your journey, how you went from pharmaceutical to deacon. Well, I mean, deacons, you know, within the Catholic Church come from a, a variety of backgrounds, and majority of them, depending on their age, are still working. Um, so it definitely is a, a vocation where you, where you can be wor- working. A deacon is somebody that ministers both, you know, inside the church and outside of the church. So again, it's very appropriate to to be working as far as that goes. Um, again, the, my journey, particular journey, where I was still working the majority of time, actually. I was still working about six months after I was ordained still, so up until that that point. Um, and again, my wife and I had just decided that, you know, as everyone can see, I'm a relatively young guy, right? Uh, so I retired a little bit on the early side, um, and that was kind of by plan. We've, the Lord really provided for us throughout our lives. You know, we worked hard, but again, we were graced with, with just, just so many gifts from, from God that we sat down with our own financial advisor and determined that, hey, we could retire early. Again, we're not living fat off the hog per se, but we, we certainly can get by and be able to give back you know, to, to serving others, serving the church, and also from a selfish point of view, have some more time to, to write. Yeah, they always say it's um, not how much you earn, it's how much you save. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I was really surprised. Remember, it was about 15 years ago, the book came out written by two PhD mathematicians, uh, The Millionaire Next Door. And the most shocking thing about that was that school teachers were the highest percent occupation of millionaires. Oh, really? I didn't because know that. Because they, they live below their means. Yeah. And when people become dentists or um, physicians or lawyers, they get too big a house, too nice right. of cars, too luxury vacation, and then they don't have any at the end. So um, what does it entail to become a deacon? Seminary school for how long? Well, not 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 a seminary school. It, every diocese in the United States will be a little different on their what they have to go through. I think the minimum throughout the country, though, as far as you know, the in America is at least four years of formation. In the diocese of Phoenix, uh, it is actually five years of what we call for, formation. But before that, they also require that you take two years uh, at the Kino Institute, Catechetical Institute, which is, again, a local program here that anybody can go to uh, to, again, learn more about the Catholic faith, theology, the teachings of the church, and things like that. So in reality nowadays, they're actually requiring that you do that Kino two years before you actually enter into that five years of discernment and and, um, just training, per se. So Awatuki has two Catholic churches. Mm-hmm. Are, are they are they kind of um, work real integrated together? Or are they pretty? Are they more separate? Or that's a good question. I mean, really, when you think about it, all Catholic churches, again, Catholic means universal, should, are working together. But it's not like we are our sister parishes that that there is that a a relationship between us in terms of that we are one of the same. They are we are two separate churches just serving a community that that has a need for two Catholic churches. So when I got here 30 years ago, it was just Corpus Christi, right. and there was 25,000 people in Ahwatukee. Now there's 85,000, two Catholic churches. So how big will Ahwatukee have to get before the foothills builds, ah, the third one? That that I don't know, but I am fascinated. I don't know about you, when I, I watched the Winter Olympics, when they had the people marching in in that ceremony, and the size of some of those countries, I'm like, Ahwatukee's bigger. Ahwatukee's bigger yeah. than some of those countries. Yeah, so. it, it, it's a weird thing because people uh, always um, compare the United States with 322 million people to like right. Sweden and and Finland and right. Denmark. And it should only be compared to countries that are at least 100 million. And so you right. compare the United States to China with a billion three, India with a billion two, um, third is America, fourth is uh, Indonesia with 200 right. million. Right. And, and, and even Nigeria is 100 million. When, when you compare or schools and healthcare and everything to countries with 100 million or more people, America looks really good, but when you compare it to Denmark or Sweden, yeah. 
you know, it looks kind of uh, crazy. I mean, um, so so tell us your journey. Um, how, how many children do you have? Two children. Oh, uh, it's hard to say children now, 33 and 28. So. <laughs> well, mo well, most people say that writing a book is like having a baby. It, it yeah. takes nine months. It's a labor of love. <laughs> Uh, did it take did it take as long uh, to make a baby as it did to write that book? Well, this one took. This would have been a very long term pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> the last, the book I just finished was actually. It's kind of weird that you throw out the nine months. It was about nine months of writing. This one really was over the course of five years, and because I, again I was working at the time, so much of the the writing that that I did while I was still working was done on airplanes and while I was traveling and, and things like that. Um, once I did retire, um, I, I had the time really to, to sit down and, 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 and finish it off, so to speak. So it was definitely a long-term pregnancy, getting that one done. Just it was because of work and everything else. It's called The Table by Dennis Lambert. So talk about talk about the book and why. What made you sit down and write a book called The Table? Well, I was inspired by um, a story in the in the Gospels, the story of a, of a centurion. Um, the centurion goes up to Jesus and says, you know, Jesus, my Lord, my, my servant is sick, you know. And Jesus pretty much says, okay, let's go, let's go, I'll, I'll take care of this. And the centurion says, no, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. So Jesus is blown away by his faith. And again, I'm paraphrasing some of the, the scriptures here. And said, so, you know, is, is, is amazed by his faith and just heals the person, the servant, long distance. Um, so after that, after this, I, I thought, what happened to that centurion? You know, what happened after that encounter with Jesus? Um, so I actually did a little research on that particular centurion. I mean, it's, there's, that's all there is in the Bible, but is there legend, tradition behind it? And there is, so I couldn't necessarily write about that centurion. But then I, I got the idea from that of, of a character of a centurion, somebody, again, under, you know, Roman rule and everything else who, you know, we think is, our people are always against Jesus. What happens if there was somebody that, that was open to the teaching of Jesus? So is it, the story in part is the story of a centurion who, who meets Jesus, has an encounter with Jesus, and is inspired and, and turned by that event. And what is a centurion? Pardon me? What is a centurion? Oh, it's like, it's a, like a Roman soldier, like maybe a sergeant or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Huh, interesting. So you always had a love for church history? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, all, it's, it's ever, ever evolving as far as that goes. But it was more of this just intrigued, like, after hearing this, 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 this gospel over and over, what happened to that guy afterwards that, that really kind of inspired the, the rest of the story? So where were you uh, born and raised, and how did you get to Ahwatukee? Well, I'm from the Chicago area. I guess everybody that's in, lived anywhere near Chicago says Chicago, but not, not the city. We were um, born up in northern, uh, northeastern Illinois there by Gurney, Illinois. Now, is that called Upper Michigan? No, the UP? Illinois, Illinois. Oh, okay. Upper Illinois. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, so, again, close to the Wisconsin border. Uh, so, born and ra raised there my, my entire life, pretty much in about a, a five-mile radius there. Um, actually met my wife, you know, Debbie, it, it, while we were in high school. We went to uh, Carmel High School in Mundelein, Illinois, right across actually from the, the, the seminary there, St. Mary's of the Lakes. And after we um, were, well, we weren't married. We were maybe, we are engaged or not quite engaged. Anyways, we both visited my grandparents who lived in Tucson. And we thought, you know, someday we're going to live here, you know. And it took many years after that that we actually made out. We, we moved out here in 2000, and we just, just love it. Yeah, um, so just the what the winters were getting you? Not so much that. You know, I mean, it's not just the winters. Where are you from, Howard? Uh, Wichita, Kansas. Okay. Yeah, in, in, in Illinois, maybe it's similar in Wichita. It's not just the winters. The winters, yes, can, can get to you. But it's like half the 50 percent of the time when in the chicago area at least the, it's gray you know it's cloudy it's rainy it's miserable and then when you finally get that that nice day the humidity will kill you you go out we actually had a really nice backyard had you know backed up to a forest reserve so you finally would have that nice day and you'd sit outside and you get eaten by mosquitoes i know but it was that it was those type of things and just also just a, a love of the desert we really fell in love with the desert and finally i mean the thing that kind of you know kept us in chicago for so long was our family was rooted there but then there there started to be a little you know people venturing off and and, and moving out and 
we thought, okay, this would be a good time. And again, most of my, 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 my immediate family now lives in Henderson, Nevada, which isn't too far. So, We did a, a family vacation to Belize. And the insects, I mean, I mean, we, we literally were confined yeah. in our room. I mean, they had 100% DDT, which is illegal in the United States. And it was just insane. And it was so cool because all my boys said they will never, ever complain about the Arizona heat because there's no insects. Yeah. And even when you go to Orlando, most people screen in their patio. Oh yeah, it's crazy. I mean, Florida, I mean, teach their own. People say, oh, I retire in Florida. We used to always take our kids down to Disneyland, you know, from Chicago, we sometimes we drive, most of the time we would drive down there. And it was insane because we do this during the summer, during the, when the kids were off school. <laughs> it was the height of the humidity, the rain, and you're right, the bugs, I'm like, I don't know. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, so, so um, is your second book related to your first book? What was your What was your second book? Well, the second book, the, I mean, again, right now, it's uh, I, I've just finished it. It's getting a little polishing and having it edited just to make sure it's it's one hundred percent. The name of the book is called the the space between good and evil, and I guess it was kind of inspired in the similar way that that I just had a thought, and that was just wondering, you know, during Nazi Germany, it's it's set you know during World War II. You know, was there ever a, a guard or a German soldier, you know, that actually didn't want to be doing what they were directed to do? I said, I thought there has to be some. So the, the, the story is about a, a prison guard in, in Nazi Germany who, again, definitely does not want to be there. You know, he grows up with a strong faith. He's, he enters in the army. Um, they actually sense from him that, that he has a soft spot, soft spot in him, that he is somewhat of a, you know, a sympathizer you know, with the Jews and stuff like that. So a cruel twist of fate, they, they send him to be trained as a, as a, as a prison guard in, inside a, a concentration camp. And he, he slowly kind of deteriorates. The, the, the surroundings actually get to him and his goodness starts to slip. And then actually one day, a, a new prisoner comes into camp. They're not always Jews, you know, who are, who are prisoners, political prisoners, and oftentimes even priests. So what happens is his pastor, who he grew up with, you know, as a boy, is now a prisoner in this camp. And that kind of snaps him out a little. And then he, 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 the, the, the priest encourages him, you know, amongst this great evil, there's good that you can do. So he starts looking for ways to, to really get back to who he was as a person and to help these people. And it's his story and also the story of a, a Jewish family that's there. Um, they have a, a young son, they have two sons. One's, young, one's about eight years old, the other's 13 years old. And 13 year old has mental disabilities. You know, nowadays we would, would call him, you know, mentally challenged or retarded. They would probably call him retarded back then, but he doesn't have Down syndrome, so doesn't have the appearances of it. And back then, if somebody was had these mental deficiencies, they would be sent off for experiments or just to be exterminated. So they have to keep that hidden. So they, these these two parties kind of meet. You know, Peter's good, the the guard is looking to protect them and look for looking for a way to have that child escape the camp. So, huh? Do you draw any parallels from those two stories? The table and. Um what is the good between or the space the, between good and evil? The space between good and evil uh, in today's um, America. Hmm. Hadn't thought about that, but I guess we could. I mean, no matter where. I mean, especially like the the the, the second book. You know, uh, there's evil always surrounding us. You know, the world is first of all is, is a great place and it is blessed and stuff. And I think we have a tendency to dwell on on the darker things, but. Again, I do believe the light will always overcome the darkness, but we, there is a lot of darkness in the world, and we can be swallowed up by it, we can be defeated by it, or we can rise up against it as far as that goes. So I think that tale, as, as far as good overcoming evil, is something that's a perpetual story that we as individuals can engage in on either side of that. So in a sense, I think that's a, a story that goes on and on. Well, I have to um, brag. Your um, book on Amazon, The Table by Dennis Lambert, only has five star reviews. You don't even have one four star review. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's pretty darn good. All your reviews are five star. Now, are those all your those family all members and cousins? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, must um, be. <laughs> you um, you're in a band with your wife, uh, Little Debbie Band. What what do you and her both playing instruments, sing? Well, she's dance? she's the singer. She is Little Debbie as as far as that goes. Um, I'm the bass player, the manager, roadie, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Now we've been we've been playing music for years. Um, in fact, started way back in Illinois. We, we was 
played in our church choirs. I've always played it in choirs and things like that, and, and Debbie did it as well. And then uh, also we started doing like parish picnic, a group of us, and then also that morphed into a band. So we've been playing probably about 30 years in Chicago. We, we had a lot of, big, well, pretty much one or two core bands. We played a lot of blues, moved out to Phoenix, and then we, we wanted just to continue that, that, that torch, so to speak, and we, we started actually a band that just did all blues here, and that's kind of morphed into classic rock and, and other things as far as that goes. So it's just... I'm Where very, are you playing all with you? Well, we played... We, we, this band, particular band, we've been really blessed. So we've been together like, geez, 16, 17 years with pretty much all the principal people still, not, which is unbelievable for, as far as bands goes. Um, and it's really more of a family. I mean, our, our friendship amongst the musicians, and I'm honored to be playing with these guys because, again, they make me sound real good as far as that goes. But throughout the, the years, we played at a lot of different places. We've um, we played at Cardinals games, Suns games, Mercury games. We've played halftime shows for the Mercury. We've played pretty much most of the venues around the area, and, and we played several times the Tempe Town Lakes 4th of July Festival, which was really cool. I mean, literally, we were the headliners there once, and there's like 10,000 people. And, of course, we played a number of times here for Randy Fitch's Concerts in the Park. So, yeah. So a lot now, of there's things. a musician in this book. Yes. Is that, uh, is that character based on Little Debbie? Yeah. I mean, it, they say writers draw from what they know. Actually, the book, too, is set, a lot of it is actually set in Ahwatukee. I wonder if I even, I can't recall if I call it Ahwatukee or not. But yes, and actually the band, again, I, I guess I'm self-grandizing, is also called the Little Debbie Band in the book. Yeah, the book really, too, it's really two stories. Um, I, I mentioned that centurion, and of course, you might be wondering, what is the table? So it's really two stories that, that, that come together. Uh, the table is actually is a table. It was built by the father of Joseph, the, the, who was the, 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 the earthly father of Jesus. And the story follows this table, you know, all the way up to modern times. Um, this table, Jesus actually, as a young child, played beneath. It was there at the wedding feast of Cana, where Jesus turned um, uh, water into wine. It was there at a scourging. Um, so the table is definitely connected to Jesus, and the apostles know this. After the scourging, that centurion I, I mentioned, his, uh, his name is Cornelius, actually acquires the table. You know, so he's in possession of the ta table. So after Jesus dies and, and rises from the dead, he gets a visit from a couple of the apostles, again, who know how important this table was to Jesus, and they ask if he would come to Jerusalem, and he meets with the apostles and Peter, and they give him a mission. You know, they, they, they make him what, what, what is called the first table bearer. Because after, you know, Jesus left the apostles, you know, he gave them a mission, go out and spread the gospel throughout the world. So they're going to different lands. And Peter asked Cornelius if he would take the table to the different places where the apostles are, you know, because again, it's a special thing that, that meant a lot to Jesus and will bring, you know, something to these different communities. So he is the table bearer. And that torch is handed down through generations all the way up to modern times. So juxtaposed with that, that story is the story of, of, a, of a character named Michael Fortunato who, he's the guy in the band, you know, him and his wife are, are in a band, they, he just, he's just about to make it big in the music industry when he loses his wife, Debbie. So he's thrown into the depths of despair, um, he's, he's totally out of it, he's lost every, everything he felt, you know, but he's still a spiritual guy. And that's when he encounters the most current table bearer who happens to be an autistic young man, you know, who actually just lost his guardian. So again, there's a mutual need there. So the table, you don't know who it is that's giving what to whom. Is it Michael giving something that this young autistic young man needs at this time? Or is it this young man in the table that brings Michael, you know, and brings him back, you know, on course and things like that. So very creative. What, what genre would you call this? That's a good question, Howard. You know, um, it would be depending on who, who, is, who is declaring the label. Uh, in the general sec secular world, it would be called inspirational fiction. In the, the Christian world of books and stuff like that, it would be Christian fiction. Or again, I'm probably even a subgenre within that, which would be called Catholic fiction, you know. Um, so. so is it hard to get published in, in that genre? Uh, well, again, I can, I'm an N of one, you know. And You're a what? An N of one, a number of one. A number so, of one? so I don't know how if I could draw, you know, a statistical, you know, give you a statistically accurate answer. My experience, it was difficult, and that could be for a couple of reasons. A, it's my first book. B, I'm not, I don't know if I'm a great writer or a good writer or what have you. 
Uh, the challenges I faced within that genre is, again, going to the larger Christian publishers that, that are out there um, and having characters that, that are Catholic, that I ran into some, some resistance with that. In other words, there, there is a bias, or there seems to be a bias in my experience many times with the larger Christian publishers about characters and things that are Catholic. Um, I mean, I received, first of all, I have a big literary agent who's big in, in Christian marketing kind of wrote me back and pretty much said, you know, it'll never fly because you can't have a Catholic character. And he, he went on to talk about how he published one Catholic author but had to take everything Catholic out of it. Um, and then I actually received an offer from an, another Christian publisher saying that they would publish the book if I would take everything Catholic out, out of it, you know. But again, being Catholic, that was hard for me to do. No. Well, and the United States has a long history of that because most of the people that were leaving Europe were doing it for religious freedom from the Catholic yeah. Church. So you trace back the Quakers and the Mennonites and the Episcopal, you know, so it was a long history of protesters until um, the Irish diaspora in 1840. And when the Irish came here, that's, they were heavily persecuted because they started building Catholic churches, of, right. which is why everybody left Europe. Yeah. And uh, so, a uh, long history of that in the United yeah. States. Well, let me be clear, I'm not trying to say that, that we're being persecuted or anything else like that. The reality is if you look at the actual marketplace, you know, for, uh, of, of the Christian fiction genre, so to speak, um, it is immense, it is huge. You know, within if you, that, what I would call that sub-genre of Catholic fiction, fiction is very small. There are very few Catholic publishers First of all, compared to, again, when I say Christian, of course Catholics are Christians, but more evangelical Protestant publishers, they dominate the, the, that, that space. Of the Catholic publishers, very few of them do fiction, you know, so they don't publish a lot of fiction. So I understand the marketplace if, again, the larger market is evangelical Protestant, you know. So I understand. So I'm not trying to say, hey, I'm, I'm being picked on. But it's just a challenge that, that, that I had as, as far as that goes. So the, the publisher that I do have is a, a smaller Catholic publisher. But again, that, that, everything's not absolute. I mean, I did have another offer from a more evangelical press to publish. And then even now, with, the, with my current book, The Space Between Good and Evil, um, I started, th this took me six weeks, or about six months to ever to get any interest, Howard. Uh, I, two days after submitting for my, my second book, I have a, a very large uh, literary agent who wants, the re who wants to, the, the, to look at the book, and it's not, not an offer, but um, they, they want to review it, and they are actually uh, a larger Christian-based literary agency. So again, I never say never, and I'm not saying that this is a, a big problem across the board. Um, now, is there an audio version? No. You know, um, I was listening to Jeff Bezos, and he, um, he said the audiobooks outsell the print. Well, yeah. Howard, you've got a pretty good voice. Maybe you could... Uh... Well, I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> I, I, this, this would be... Um, I think this would take you um, five hours. But what, what Jeff Bezos was saying that, you know, when people say um, um, reading is dead, he says it's moved to multitasking. So people in Ahwatukee, a lot of them have an hour commute every day to downtown. Yeah. So they, they don't like talk radio. Um, they're moving towards podcasts like what we're doing. Um, most of the feedback I've got from this show is um, people commuting downtown to Phoenix for an hour. And they say it's really cool because they drive by these businesses and churches and they get to put the person behind the face. But if you sat down and read that... Yeah nonstop for six hours, um, it'll, it'll... Yeah, my son is just, just all over, I guess it's Audible is a, is a yeah. place, stuff like that. So he does, a, he's driving all around and he's, he, he, I mean, he's a reader, but he's like, I hardly read anymore because I, I get it on the... You know, yeah, and I don't even watch uh, cable TV anymore because I would rather go to YouTube uh -huh. and, and watch it on YouTube. And this, it seems silly that you could watch it on this film, but the bottom line is what you do is you sit in your chair and you hold it up into your big screen and you move it forward till you can't see the big screen and it's about like right there. Yeah. And so I'd just sit, sit on my patio and lean this against a bottle of water, and I'd, I'd rather do that than watch uh, TV. But yeah, audiobooks is, is a thing. So let's go back to um, a deacon. How long have you been a deacon now? Uh, just about four years. 
Four years. So it took you four years to become a deacon. Well, actually, five years. But yeah, five years, and now you've been one for four years. Right. What, what is that? What is the life of a deacon here in Ahwatukee at Corpus Christi? What, what are you? Okay. What are you doing? Well, d being a deacon, first of all, there's two types of deacons. There's the the permanent deacon, which which I am, and also there's transitional deacons. Because sometimes you know people might hear a deacon, isn't that when you're on your way to becoming a priest? And that is what a, a transitional deacon is the last year before somebody is ordained to the priesthood. But this is totally separate. So the permanent deacons, such as myself, you know, are, we're charged universally, and then I'll get to what, what I do around here, for you know, f to do three things. That's charity, liturgy, and the word. In other words, the first deacons that that came about out of the early church, you know, there were seven men that, that were, were asked to to step forward because the apostles, Peter et al., you know, were really busy preaching and doing things like that. And the charitable works of the church, they they, they was just getting too much for them to handle it all. So they they came up with seven deacons to go ahead and carry out that works to help the widows and things like that. So one of the hallmark things that a deacon does is works of charity. Uh, then, of course, I mentioned liturgy. We, we do participate in liturgical things. You'll, you'll find us on the altar assisting the priest and at different things. We also um, we actually baptize uh, children. We also bury people. We can, we can marry people. Um, so we do have that liturgical function as well. And then the last is what we call the Word. In other words, to be preaching God's gospel. Either it's you know, at Mass you know, or just in our daily lives. So that's kind of what deacons do, per se, across the board. Um, here at Corpus Christi, I'm, I'm doing all those things. Um, I'm very involved in our men's ministry. Uh, we, we've got uh, a really good program going on that, that, that I'm kind of, you know, spiriting as far as that goes. I, I get involved with all the liturgical things. Um, within the Diocese of Phoenix, all deacons are asked to do two things, to, to assist to, at everything that, that the parish needs, and then to have an outside ministry outside of the parish. For that, um, I volunteer my time with, with AmeriCare, which is a, a hospice um, organization here in the Valley. So I, I visit people that are, are in hospice uh, on a regular basis, which is a, a joy to do. Um, that's a joy to do. Oh yeah. Uh, it, it seems like that would be kind of a, a depressing. I mean, uh, that's yeah. when people no longer are getting treatment; they're just sent home to die. Correct. I, I, I hear you. You know, I, I don't know why. I, because I mean, I'll hear that from a lot of people. Uh, but to me, I just I, I couldn't think of anything that, that's more fulfilling. In fact, you know, I, I actually feel a lot of times like when I'm doing this, people think I, I'm giving. You know, I'm really giving something of myself, or whatever. And I, I feel more like a thief that I'm giving, getting more out of this. Um, because again, I think any time we have a, an opportunity to serve, you know, whether it's for the church, whether it's for Christ, or just just doing our, our human good for the world, we get a, a great sense of accomplishment out of that. And to be part of somebody whose life, you know, to help somebody that, that is declining, that there's not that much more life to, to be able to bring them whatever it is that God wants me to bring to them. You know, a lot of times if it's, you know, again, being Catholic, if it's a Catholic patient, um, you know, bringing them the Eucharist and things like that, it's just, Again, we, we receive so much more, you know, than we could ever give. At least, at least I do. So, how do you how do you find the Catholics in hospice? Is there a Catholic hospice? Or? Well, Americare actually is a Catholic hospice, but I mean, oh, not, not okay. all the patients are, are Catholic. You know, I'm saying that. I mean, there's when I'm with a Catholic patient. Is that a national company or a local? No, it's a local company. Local right? Arizona. Yeah. Here, yeah. And they um, here in Ahwatukee or? Oh, it's it's, it's, it's as valley wide as valley far as that goes. Yes. So, what is the depth? What what is the um, Thoughts usually in the last part of life. I mean, when these people are know that you know they don't have much time left, are they a lot of depression, crying, are they acceptance? That's or? not been my experience. I've been doing this for, gosh, it's been four or five years, you know, and I don't see that so much, you know. Um, and again, just just to, again, this care too is not like we, lots of people think, oh, hospice care that that person is going to is is dying. I mean. Part of what this is, sometimes we do that. We go right to people, we call it vigil service, and, and stay with somebody who is, death is eminent. But usually, you're talking about being visiting somebody for a year or, or more sometimes. You know, it, they're, you know they know they, their prognosis is, is not good and things like that, but it's, it's visiting that person for actually a, a longer period of time. And sometimes there's fear and things like that, but I, I guess maybe that's one of the things that... that 
I said that I feel like I'm thieving or, or stealing is just just the being inspired by by so many of these people whose faith is strong, you know, and it's it's a blessing too for people too just to, to help help them realize, you know, that this ain't it, and that, and that that's and that's true, you know. Our Lord gives us such a great life in this life, and most people that I meet will say, yeah, even though we've hit some snags in our life, some dark valleys we don't want to go into, that, that all in all, this life is pretty darn good. And that is a gift, you know, from God himself. This, this life is a pure gift. And if we think this one is pretty darn good, you know, and I'm definitely misquoting our Lord here, or paraphrasing, you know, he said time and time again, you know, in scriptures, you ain't seen nothing yet. So the same God who gave us this life, you know, is promising us something that we can't even fathom that's better than this, you know, in the next. That brings me a whole lot of peace. And if somebody, if I can help somebody to feel that way, that, that, that maybe is having a, a tough time, again, it's just, just a blessing to be able to do that. Would you say, um, you've been at um, Corpus Christi since 2000, right? Uh, no. Actually, uh, when I, after, I mean, when we moved here, my wife and I, we, we, um, we, we went, were at St. Timothy's in Mesa. Um, again, music tied into that too. When I was living in um, Illinois, my wife and I, we, our parish was uh, St. Paul the Apostle in Gurney, Illinois, and, and I was playing in the choir. You know, um, and we used to play all this music from the guys at St. Tim's. You know, so when we went, when we moved here, we said, "Well, where is St. Tim's? It wasn't that far away." And St. Tim's is really well known for its music. I mean, um, I played with Tom Booth, who's who's written, who's who's world known. He's played. Played, uh, was commissioned by the Pope to write a song that led to uh, Matt Marr, who now has been nominated for six or seven Grammys, you know, and here these guys are, and I'm playing with them, you know, as far as that. So, the, so that was a wonderful experience, um, but the, there was a need here at Corpus Christi, you know, they were getting short deacons, and the bishop asked it if, if I would move over here. Um, Bishop asks, you know, it, it, and that's that's another. I mean, it was such a blessing to be asked. I mean, we were so happy at St. Tim's, you know, but it wasn't like, you know, kicking and screaming, I don't want to leave. Just the the ability to to be obedient is a blessing. I don't know if that makes sense to you or, or whatever, but to be asked, you know, by the bishop to do something, you know, it, it was it was just you know actually a wonderful thing. And long story short, you know, again, we did not come over here kicking and screaming, oh, we don't want to come. You know, it's like, this is where the Lord wants us, this is where we'll go. And bottom line is, uh, I've learned that the bishop and the Holy Spirit know a whole lot better what's better for me and my wife because we just love it at Corpus Christi. You know, we, we, we we're very, very blessed. So, how long so I've been, been here, at yeah, Corpus about a year and a half now. Year and a half? Yeah. yeah. Would you say, um, the priesthood is and deacons are growing or flat or declining. Well, I'm not an expert per se on that that topic. Um, again, the priesthood and the diaconate are definitely two separate things. You know, I know that we are getting a lot of vocations here uh, out of the diocese of Phoenix for the priesthood. Really? Um, yeah. So I can't quantify it. You know, yeah. or, or whatever. My sense is though that, that that we are are growing here as a diocese in terms of, of vocations. Certainly, we could always use more as far as that goes. And the, as far as deacons goes, we definitely have a, a very healthy group. I think nationally we may have, I, I, again, I don't know this for a fact, but my sense is we may have a, a pretty high ratio of deacons, you know, or number of deacons relative to other dioceses too. And the, 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 the Diocese of Phoenix, their, their diaconate formation program is, I think, recognized throughout the country as one of the best. I know the guys that run it, uh, Deacon Jim Trent um, and, and Deacon Doug Bogart are constantly, you know, being asked by other dioceses for information on how we form deacons here and things like that. So it's going pretty well. That's interesting. Um, you know, when I look at that table, I always think, you know, what are the pillars of a community? It's got to be church has got to be one of those legs, the schools, um, the government, the businesses. I mean, um, do you agree or... Oh, I certainly agree. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to disagree with those. Of course, I'd go strong on, on that that faith church part more than anything else. I think if you have that, all the other pieces will fall into place the way God wants them to. If that's absent, then there can be troubles on those other legs. Yeah, it's a very uh, big part of the community. Um, so, um, when's your when your um, when do you think your new book will be on Amazon? 
Well, again, it, it depends. You know, right now I'm looking. I have you know two. I have a, a, one publisher who who wants to to read the book again. Um, I, I'm kind of a, what I would call a blue collar writer. I, I'm not. I wasn't an English major or anything else like that. <laughs> so before I actually, you know, I finish this book a little. You know, finish it. I I go to have it edited. You know, so it is putting a little polish on it to make sure the grammar's right and everything else. Not that I'm terrible, but I just want to make sure it's you know as as good as it can be. So tip going before when I submitted for this book that it took like about six months before I got any interest I thought well while it's getting edited I will float a few queries out and sure enough two days after I queried the first one I got somebody who wants it and then I have a, a publisher who um, I was in talking with before and gave a proposal even long before the book was finished who, who would like to take a look at it so it's really dependent on you know, once I get the, the actual finished manuscript in hand and start that querying process, now if one of these two um, people want the book and it's a good match, it could come out a lot sooner. If not, it's again a little bit of an expedition to, to find a publisher. So your website is Dennis Lambert hyphen, or would you call that slash, Ryan? Or what is that? Hyphen, I think. Hyphen. Yeah. That's hyphen. Dennis Lambert hyphen writer.com. What are they going to find if they go to your website? Can they contact you? Through sure. that website? Absolutely. Yep. I mean, there, there you'll find a little bit more about uh, uh, the table, uh, different various appearances I've made on the radio. This will be posted there as far as that goes, a little bit about myself and things like that. Nice. And then uh, and then uh, the Corpus Christi website is Corpus Christi PHX, Corpus Christi PHX.org. Uh, are you involved in their website much or? Nope, not, not not. But I mean, it's a good place to go if you want to know our mass times or what's going on at the parish. Yeah. Well, you're a, a very interesting guy, and uh, I just want to thank you for um, all that you do uh, for the community. Um, thank you so much for coming by and talking about your book, and uh, thank you for all your charity that you do in Awatuki, liturgy and the Word. Um, give my. Uh, oh, I got to ask on on your website. Uh, you're laying there next to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's my dog Goose. Uh, Goose? Goose? Yeah. <laughs> I, again, I, I kind of a big no-no. No, it's not so much a no-no in book. They say with, like when you write a book or a story, stuff like that, and you make reference inside references to people and things like that. I'm winking like I'm in a sandstorm in this book because one of the my dog Goose makes an appearance in it. So the picture on the website. There he is, Ryan. <laughs> there he is. That's a good-looking dog. Yeah. So Goose got winked in the book. So uh, what kind of dog is he? He's a rat terrier, Boston terrier mix. Man, nice. Good looking yeah. dog. <laughs> well, give Goose my love. And uh, I, um, when you uh, come out with your next book, you got to come back and talk about that one again. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Thank you very much.